Retina Rounds episode number 45, Fever-Associated Tractional Retinal Detachment. In this video from guest surgeon Dr. Aaron Nagel, we'll show you the management of a macula encroaching exudative and tractional retinal detachment secondary to familial exudative vitreoretinopathy retinopathy that was managed with a combination of a scleral buckle and vitrectomy. This is the first in a series of videos focusing on pediatric vitreoretinal surgery featuring Dr. Nagel, who is Chief of Pediatric Retina at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Stay tuned for our weekly podcast where we'll have a longer format interview with Dr. Nagel. We'll learn about his career trajectory to becoming a leading pediatric retina specialist in the United States. We'll discuss special considerations in pediatric vitreoretinal surgery, and he'll provide some pearls on how to perform endoscopic vitrectomy. The case we'll present today is a 13-year-old patient with a history of fever complicated by progressive exudative and tractional retinal detachment encroaching on the macula. The patient has been treated with laser photocoagulation and intravitreal anti-VEGF agents, and the goal of surgery is to relieve vitreoretinal traction and hopefully decrease any tractional component that's encouraging vascular leakage. So let's jump into the case. You can see here that the conjunctiva has been opened and a 41-band scleral buckle has been placed. Uh, Dr. Nagel is uh, injecting some dilute triamcinolone to stain uh, the vitreous, and you can notice uh, the vessels that are being dragged and straightened towards the area of exudation in the suprotemporal quadrant. Now just cleaning out uh, the residual triamcinolone, and Dr. Nagel is going to go ahead and proceed with the uh, pars plana vitrectomy. You can see some staining posteriorly indi indicating that the posterior hyaloid is still down, but he's going to go ahead and debulk some of this vitreous uh, peripherally before uh, inducing the PVD. You can see he's moving uh, slowly and carefully so as to not exert too much traction around the retina, particularly in the area of tractional detachment, so as to not create a retinal break. Now using um, max grip forceps, a, a PVD is being in, uh, induced. Uh, you can see here uh, that uh, the, the posterior cortical gel is being engaged with the forceps and is slowly being elevated and detached from the macular surface. Now at this point, once the, the posterior cortical gel has been fractured, uh, the, um, the vitreous cutter can be used to engage uh, the vitreous and to extend uh, that PVD uh, more peripherally. But it's important here, since the area of traction uh, is in this, temporal air, in this temporal quadrant, we want to decrease the amount of traction that we're exerting in that area. And so we're going to want to uh, elevate the posterior hyaloid, not just temporally over the macula, but also extend it over nasally. And in the nasal location, it's going to be a little bit safer to go ahead and further uh, detach uh, the posterior cortical gel. So you can see here very nicely that uh, posterior gel has been elevated in the juxtapapillary region. And now going back to the vitreous cutter, the hyaloid is being elevated nasally away from the area of the TRD. Um, and, and once that, uh, that hyaloid has been elevated, you can see the sort of billowing of the, of the hyaloid. The fluidics are now uh, are working in Dr. Nagel's favor to propagate that PVD. So a combination of the fluidics and a direct aspiration of the posterior cortical gel is gonna allow for that uh, hyaloid to be lifted. Uh, elevating the posterior hyaloid in younger patients, as, as you uh, well know, it can be very challenging since the, the hyaloid can be tightly adherent to the retina, and so using a combination of forceps uh, and um, the vitrectory can be very helpful. Now that the posterior hyaloid has been elevated, Dr. Nagel has gone back to the, um, the max grip forceps and is now elevating the posterior cortical vitreous gel towards the area of the vitreous base contraction. Sometimes in, in eyes where there's uh, quite a bit of, uh, of exudation, the retina can be a little bit more uh, prone to developing tears. And a tear in this particular eye uh, would be um, potentially lead to a very bad outcome. And so very carefully, he's lifting up the hyaloid up to the level of the vitreous base, but not pull beyond that uh, so as to not create uh, any peripheral retinal breaks. Once that's been elevated, now using the vitreous cutter, uh, he's going to go ahead and trim back uh, that fibrotic uh, vitreous. And you can see again, he's going very slowly and methodically using the cutter bit by bit to, to slowly dissect back and, and uh, delaminate away uh, that, uh, that vitreous from the retinal surface. Here, less is more, so uh, not being too aggressive is a good idea to, again, prevent any peripheral retinal breaks. Next, a uh, partial air fluid exchange is performed uh, and the case is completed. 
So just a few um, discussion points regarding fever. Uh, familial exudative vitreoretinopathy has a variable inheritance pattern. More commonly, it's going to be autosomal dominant, but there are autosomal recessive and X-linked recessive uh, inheritance patterns. And there can be a variable degree of penetrance. So um, in, in, it can be asymmetric. In one eye, uh, there may be more advanced disease than uh, in the fellow eye. The disease looks very similar to retinopathy of prematurity, although uh, it's going to be seen in patients who don't have a history of prematurity or, um, or high levels of oxygen exposure uh, in the uh, perinatal period. It can look like other uh, diseases where there are also abnormalities of the retinal vasculature, including nori disease, incontinentia pigmenti, Coats disease, and infectious conditions like toxicara. Uh, these can generally be uh, distinguished from a fever based on the presence of other ophthalmic or systemic findings. For example, in nori disease, one might see microphthalmia, developmental delay, uh, deafness. Uh, Coats disease is gonna be uh, seen more often in uh, male patients than female patients, and usually you won't see any signs of uh, neovascularization in Coats disease. Uh, Toxicara uh, is gonna be uh, typically unilateral, not bilateral, uh, and it's gonna be associated with uveitis. Incontinentia pigmenti um, can be also associated with systemic findings, including seizures and developmental delay. Uh, and um, since it's X-linked dominant, it's going to be lethal uh, in, in male patients. The clinical manifestations of fever um, can vary. Uh, in the earlier stages, uh, there may just be uh, signs of avascular peripheral retina. This is typically going to be bilateral, but again, it can be asymmetric. Uh, and then this can be followed by both intraretinal and extraretinal vascular ab abnormalities. The extraretinal vascular abnormalities will be the neovascularization. Uh, then there can be um, exudation and um, contraction of the overlying vitreous with membrane formation, and that can lead to uh, tractional retinal detachment. Epiretinal membranes over the macular surface can also be seen uh, in fever. Here's a clinical classification or staging for fever that was first described by Drs. Pendergast and Tracy back in 1998. You can see here that there are five stages. The first stage is where there is avascular retina in the periphery without neovascularization. Patients at this stage can typically be observed closely. However, if there are significant areas of, of peripheral non-perfusion, those areas can be lasered to decrease the chance for exudation or tractional membrane formation. Stage two is where there's avascular retina with neovascularization, and that can be further subdivided into patients with and without exudation. Patients at this stage are treated with, uh, with laser photocoagulation to the areas of avascular retina. Anti-VEGF uh, injections have also been studied uh, for this patient population. And it's important to, pa uh, to treat patients at this stage because that can significantly decrease the risk of progression to later stages of the disease where there can be poor visual outcomes. Stage three disease is a partial retinal detachment not involving the fovea, and that can be further subdivided into those that are primarily exudative or primarily tractional. This is the stage of the patient uh, presented by Dr. Nigel, and patients who have a retinal detachment at this stage can be managed either with uh, scleral buckling, uh, pars plana vitrectomy, or a combination thereof. Stage four disease is where there's a subtotal retinal detachment that's involving the fovea, again, uh, which can be uh, subdivided into either primarily exudative or primarily tractional. And then finally, stage five disease is where there's a total retinal detachment, and this can be further subdivided into open funnel and closed funnel configurations. Again, we wanna thank Dr. Nigel for sharing this case with us, uh, giving us an opportunity to learn a little bit more about fever. And even for adult uh, vitreoretinal specialists who may not manage fever patients, the lessons learned from this case can be applicable to multiple scenarios of peripheral tractional retinal detachment, for example, in patients with diabetic retinopathy or with proliferative vitreoretinopathy. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.